shops, schools, cafes, a university and some dog sledding, all at over 78 degrees north. There is surely no other town in the Arctic that can compete with Svalbard's colourful capital, Longyearbyen. Later in the film, I'll be speaking to scientist Katie about what it's actually like to live here. But first, some background as to why there's a settlement here in the first place. The town sits in the Longyear Valley, on the south bank of the Advent Fjord. The climate is polar tundra, and the town experiences 24-hour darkness for 84 days in winter. But despite that, Longyearbyen is worryingly the fastest warming town in the world, with temperatures rising five times faster than the global average over the last 50 years. Translated, the name of the settlement means Longyear City. So, who was Longyear? John Munro Longyear was an American industrialist who first visited Spitsbergen, as it was generally known then, in 1901. He immediately saw huge potential for coal mining operations. His Arctic Coal Company staked a claim and so began Svalbard's long coal mining history. A company town grew up with American management and Norwegian labourers. Over the years, as an independent Norway grew to be one of Europe's richest countries, the tables turned. Norway formally acquired the archipelago through the 1920 Spitsbergen Treaty and also acquired the mining companies. Sadly, nothing remains of the original town after it was burnt to the ground by German forces in the Second World War. Since the 1980s, coal mining has significantly declined and the town's two principal sectors are now research and tourism, with cruise ships docking almost every day in summer. There's an easy way to tell the tourists from the locals here. The tourists are carrying the most expensive cameras known to man, and the locals are carrying guns. The aerial tramways which carried coal to the port are no longer in operation, but remain as cultural monuments. The cableways may not be operating, but the industrial heritage still dominates the town. You can almost hear it. From this small Lutheran church high over the town, the Svalbard priest presides over the largest parish in Europe. Only around 3,000 people, of course, but that's not the point. It's size that counts. The town has a population of around 2,500, which is constantly revolving, with very few people staying more than seven years. The governor, or Cecil Mestre, who administers the territory on behalf of the Norwegian government, is based here, as is the airport and UNIS the university, a joint undertaking of Norway's four main universities, which accommodates students and lecturers from all over the world. The college is part of the Svalbard Science Centre, and this is also where you'll find the award-winning museum. Coffee and cuddly dogs, that's me sold. This is Husky's, my favourite cafe, serving probably the last flat white before the North Pole. If you open a new commercial enterprise here, then you can almost guarantee that it'll be the world's northernmost. The northernmost brewery, supermarket, full service hotel, and even the world's northernmost chocolatier. Now I want to find out what it's like to actually live in this remote community at 78 degrees north. So my name is Katie. Um, I've lived here for about seven years now and uh, initially I was a PhD student but now I moved on to being a postdoc so I've been doing research pretty much continuously the whole time uh, and one of the things I've been using to do the research are these really big radars behind me. <laughs> uh, Katie this is a very small town surrounded by a hostile environment. When you first came here could you ever imagine that seven years later you would still be here? Uh, probably not. I mean I thought it would be six months so <laughs> it's uh it's been a lot longer <laughs> um but I, I think that once you kind of 
experience it here you never really kind of forget it and there are a few people well a lot of people who get trapped we call it uh, and then yeah I remember I was I was leaving at the airport after my six months and then I was crying because I was so sad to leave and then the woman at the airport counter was like if you want to come back you'll find a way <laughs> because everybody here understands it like this feeling like when you leave like if you're one of these trapped people <laughs> that you you can't go back to living like a normal person on in a in a big town at least not yet. <laughs> Often people feel trapped in Long Yubian, uh if they're living in the town because they want to be out into the nature. So I think it's Falbad that traps people. I feel like it's one of the few places in the world that is still like truly wild at least like that I have found is like one of the few places where you can go out and you can basically see nothing from what humans have made uh, and you can see all of these beautiful nature and if you're lucky polar bears and uh, arctic foxes and yeah you get I think after living here for one year you get very in sync with the nature so you know when the birds are coming you know what the birds are called you know everything about the sun going up and down in the tides and I can safely say that when I lived in Middlesbrough I didn't know any of this information <laughs> Yeah, so obviously you don't need a visa if, you're, uh, if your country has signed this Svalbard Treaty. So then we have a lot of different nationalities. So that is another one of the things I liked because you can feel like, you know, your experience in the culture of uh, tens of different places all at once. And you might be, you know, in invited to the national day of this country or this country or this country. And you learn about, yeah, what, what are you guys eating there? And what is it like there? So I, I I don't think I've also been anywhere else in the world like that international and it's all it's also changing all the time because people come and go so there's like different fluxes of people from different places so you never really get bored of meeting new people and it's always interesting to be like what brought you here <laughs> to to this place in the middle of nowhere <laughs> but still 84 days of total darkness 84 yeah uh, uh for me i'm pretty busy in the dark time because there's lots of aurora so <laughs> so I, I think it helps to keep busy like there are other people who maybe rely on going out in the boat uh or you know yeah just generally love to go out and hike or ski and then especially in the time when it's dark but there's no snow people can feel very like trapped and that there's nothing to do and that it's dark all the time and yeah you you have to be a bit careful and you also got to keep an eye on people in these times if they're lonely or anything like this um but i think yeah just to keep a keep a normal rhythm uh have this wake up light that simulates the sunrise and sunset so you could trick your body a little bit take a lot of vitamin d um and there's a lot of people who use this time as like a cozy time with friends so there's a lot of making like really nice food and dinners for people 5 p.m and it'll be completely dark and, and cozy and you light a lot of candles so i think it's uh that's those are some good survival tips for a dark season on svalbard <laughs> You're a very good turn to with him. Oh yeah, but uh, Plet, he just jumps up and head goes straight in the face. You know? <laughs> so you've got to like watch yourself so you can knock him back down. But this is the team that my dog runs in. So we introduced him like, when, when he was a puppy. So they learned not to eat him. <laughs> As a town, Long Yibian has a unique set of challenges that go beyond polar bears and the climate. There is a lack of affordable housing, particularly for those working in the private sector. Local democracy is also a challenge. The town's community council has only been in existence since 2001, and voting for non-nationals is limited to those who have at least three years residence on mainland Norway. There are more than 50 nationalities represented in Long Yibian, and they surely need to have their say if the town is to stay united. These issues are currently being explored in an exhibition at the museum.
Long Yearpian really grows on you. But could you live here permanently with 84 days of darkness in the winter? I'm not sure I could.